Hi, Pradia, can you hear me? Did I say your name right? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, did I say your name correctly? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Um, I just heard you look like you said my last name. Oh, okay. Um, sorry. Yeah, um, I wanted to ask before we started class, um, you are you taking the class for credit? Yes. Okay. I just want to double check because I know we have to hand in the notebook and I'm assuming that we have to do that by the end of the night or sometime whenever. Um, no notebook. I don't have a notebook. He was saying something like he wanted like all of your notes and then, you know, he gave us assignments to the semester. Yeah, I have two I need to turn in. Okay, yeah. He wants those with all the notes I guess you took on the class. And I think I think if you scan them or take pictures of it and like email it to him, he'd accept that. Um, and that's what I was asking you. Is it just those two assignments? I just want to make sure I yeah, have everything. Yeah, because I've already turned in uh, two already that previously I've turned in because I think it was a total of four, but I know I've turned in two. There were four assignments? Yeah, it was four. I turned in two worksheets already. Okay, so I'm missing two. I only did two. So that's why I wanted to ask. Um, do you remember how long ago they were assigned? The other two? I want to say March and eight, March, uh, March. I know it was two, in, I believe it was two in March. No, February and then March is one in February and then is one in March. And mm -hmm. then these last two, which was one was last month and then the recent one he sent I think last week, yes. Okay, so I need to find an assignment for each month, February, March, April, and then the one he sent last week. Okay, I need to check those out and do those then. I'll find them and print them out and start working on them. Nuts, I had a feeling because I was going to turn them in with just the two. I didn't really notice the other two and, and all the jumble of stuff he's been sending. So yeah, I'll... I don't I don't have any notes. I just work on, go through the worksheet and just answer the questions. Uh, pertaining to the worksheet okay yeah yeah, yeah i don't know what he's talking about the notes i don't have any notes i guess because we've been listening to him i think he i mean remember at yeah. the very beginning of class he gave us kind of instead of giving us a syllabus he had like a a sheet with the requirements for the class uh-huh uh-huh that that said that at the end of the term that we we're supposed to turn in our notebooks but okay, I don't so even have a notebook. I just print the stuff out and not be sneaking and doing it and printing it out at work. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. He hasn't been very clear about what he wants, like some of the yeah, other. Yeah, I was just taking this class. Um, I said it was credit. They say it was free, so I just took it because I started back. Um, uh, I've been a student at. Uh, I didn't take any in January because I didn't get my financial aid filled out until later. Mm -hmm. So I missed it, but I take start back in June. I'm taking one summer class at HBU. That's where I'm working oh. on my master's at. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Okay. I just thought I would ask. I'm glad I asked you because that means I've got to find track them those other two worksheets and, and fill those out before I hand in anything at the end of the term. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Y'all got there before me. Yes, sir. Yes. Now is it showing up? Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yes, good evening, sir. Yes, sir. 
That's all, usually, Ada, Canva, and Claudia. And then Carolyn and Angie and you. Okay, um, we want to look tonight at uh, the modern versions. Yes, and I'll have to get these sorted for you. Yes. No. I'm not sure what it's done here. Come in, come in. Tomorrow. Well, I think we plan to be. My, 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 my,
Yes. He is, yes. He's going to continue the classes. And, no, he's going to he's planning on commuting. At least. Yes. Family. Yeah, I thought that one boy that got married, I thought he was Yes. And it's right well, after you get off of 518, it'll be on your right hand side. Really? Just go down 518? Go down, go down freeway to 518, get off and go east, and it'll be on the right hand side, not more than a couple of blocks. Okay. I, think it's, I think it's on the corner of that very first street behind the uh, shopping center and everything along there. So go down the freeway, take the light. On to 518. Left on the 518. Oh, left. East. Left. And that's for? In the city. Oh, the city. You know. And then the church will be on your right hand side very soon. And there is a. That's fine. If you meet with people every week, that's going to be quite a task. Yeah, I don't know how he's going to do it, but okay. Uh, I sent a whole bunch of things to you this time. Um, you all in the paper have one list that has English translations on it. Um, let me see if I can get the right one here. Song lineage pose. Yes, all that's for tonight. Um, they got one of these, I think, lists like this. But the one I wanted to look at first, just to give you an idea, English translations grouped. Here it is. It uh, looks like this. This is just a list. And it actually has some of the earlier English translations and then a bunch of the more modern ones. And it's just a list to kind of give you an idea of geographical connection of that kind of thing. Uh, strictly a matter for you to look at when you're interested um, to see about it. Um, what we're gonna spend most of the time with um, is uh, building on this little chart. It's the uh, first page looks like this translation comparison chart. And uh, this gives you a fairly popular view of the translation style of a significant number of these modern translations in terms of how literal they are or how word for word they are versus how dynamic 
or thought for thought they are. And uh, at the far left, word for word, you have a literal interlinear where actually they, they have the Greek text and then underneath it, they show you the definition of the Greek word or the Hebrew word for the Old Testament. And then they translate that the way it's translated in the text, in a text, so you have kind of a sensible translation along with it. So it's an absolute literal because it follows the original Hebrew or, or um, Greek text. Uh, and so as we mentioned last week in Hebrew, often the English, the, the verb will be at the very first of the phrase or the sentence. Um, and so the interlinear will follow that. And so you'll have the verb and then you'll have the subject and then some of the other things that go along. And then they usually then convert that into some kind of an English sentence that makes a little better sense in English. But you can actually see the, the word order that you have in the text. And then at the far right side, you have the message, which is clearly a paraphrase. Uh, he reads the verse, the maybe even the whole paragraph, and then he rewords the whole paragraph or the whole sentence or two or three sentences in what he thinks is a meaningful, well said, modern slang almost English. The Living Bible is not too far in from that, which was literally a paraphrase in modern English of the American Standard Translation, which was a revision of the King James in 1901. And it had all the these and the thous and all that kind of stuff, just like King James did. Well, <clears throat> the man knew he couldn't read that to his kids and it would make any sense. So rather than trying to do this off the top of his head, he started preparing his Bible reading for his kids every night by taking the passage he was going to read in the American Standard and then rewording it in elementary age English that he thought his kids would understand. And so you have a translation where he was trying to say to his kids what he thought this verse said. And then you have their uh, classification of all the rest of the major modern translations. Uh, the contemporary English version, the good news translation, which were pretty much a matter again of the good news translation was actually made for English as second language people. And so he again started with a high, uh, an elementary age vocabulary. And he said, how would these English speaker, these people trying to learn English, how would they hear this said if it was said by a modern American person? How would he say this? Uh, on the other end, you have the new American standard which is simply a rehash, a modernization of the American standard, which was a modernation of the King James. And it's an attempt to again, follow the text as closely as it can, uh, keeping as often as it can, the same word in English for the same word in Hebrew or the same word in English. So you can have some consistency of, but as a result, of course, you kind of get bad English. Uh, it's acceptable English, partly because the King James did that. So we're kind of used in Bible reading to getting these reverse sentences uh, where the verb kind of comes first. Uh, instead of how are you, it's you or how, or that, those kind of things, you know. Uh, and then you get the... Uh, various translations. Here's the NIV, which is the modern uh, popular one. Here's the English Standard Version, which fundamentally is a revision of this Revised Standard Version. Uh, 
they, they semi-independently translate. But the reality is if the revised standard version didn't need to be changed uh, because of text or knowledge of language um, or the English was not too bad, then it didn't get changed. Uh, and then you have the King James, which is clear over here because the King James translators were a little more English sensitive than the new than the American Standard translator to it. And you know, that's obvious in the poetry. That's the reason why the King James stayed so popular. It, of course, was pretty popular because it became the standard for the English. And so the way you say this is, of course, the way the King James said it. Uh, but it was done with guys who knew English and spoke English well. And so there are numerous passages in the translation where the King James isn't exactly literal. They were a little more English literary. And so it doesn't fall clear over to the left. Uh, the uh, New King James uh, is considered a little bit more idiomatic than the King James. I don't know how they, you know, who, who decided that? Uh, and in addition to the modern, to the new King James, there's the modern King James. And then there's a new one called uh, the modern English Bible. Uh, and it's uh, even more literal translation than the King James, but it, it operates with the King James as its basis. Uh, and then there's even a 21st century King James, somebody else revised the King James, modernizing the English. So uh, the mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I always thought that. Uh, when, when this church started, I was the pastor here and we had a lot of people who were really committed to the King James. Oh, yeah. And so I always used the King James, but I read it in modern English when I was reading it out loud. And they would occasionally, you know, the first few times I did it, what translation are you reading? And I opened the Bible and showed them. It was the King James, said right there on the cover, King James Version. And I had a great big print one. So when I'd open it, they could see it. And they could see the these and the vowels. And, well, that's not how you read it. And I said... And, I, and they would say, well, that's not how you read it. And I said, of course not. That's not how you speak. Uh, yeah. Okay, so you have these two uh, uh, charts that show this. And then we have a series of examples. Let me blow this one up. Here we have Proverbs. I can make that do it a different size, but I don't know how to make it do that. Um, a friend that has friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's King James. The New American Standard modernizes that. A man of many friends comes to ruin. Slightly different translation. So the uh, chances are you're dealing with a textual issue here. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And then you can see how the English Standard Version, a man of many companions, not friends. Now, why is companions better English translation than friends. Well, I suppose that's possible. That's possible. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And then you get clear over here to the message, friends come and go. <laughs> but there is one friend who sticks by you. Okay. Yeah. 
And so you can see the clear paraphrasing. He's not concerned about whether the word family was there or not, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, see the explanation here, the King James followed the Septuagint, which I doubt they actually did. My suspicion is the King James in that first phrase, a friend that has friends must show himself friendly. My suspicion is they followed the Latin Vulgate, which followed the Septuagint. And then um, here we have Romans 3.25, speaking of Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Um, in English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, all keep the fancy word propitiation. The NIV translates that as a sacrifice of atonement. The literal word here is um, uh, mercy seat. Mercy seat. It's the word in the Greek that was used by the Greek translators to translate that term of the lid on the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, which in the Old Testament English usually gets translated as mercy seat. Uh, and the Greek word that was used to translate that Hebrew word, so it was in the Septuagint Bible of Jesus' day. And that's the word that's actually used here. So propitiation is even uh, an interpretation, not even a translation. And uh, they don't have the revised standard in here. Uh, the revised standard changes this word from propitiation to, ex it's right there on the table, to expiation. Uh -huh. And there's a whole theological argument over whether it had to be propitiation or expiation. I guess it was that one. Take that one. Maybe this one went with it too. Okay. Uh, and uh, because supposedly the word propitiation has. Um, uh, emotional uh, tense in it, that is, the person is assuaged, and expiation simply means the debt got paid off. Uh, and then you can go all the way over. Uh, the NIV makes it a sacrifice of atonement, which again is an interpretation. Um, and the New Living Translation, which is not a simple revision of the Living Bible. It's a committee new translation kind of in between the Living Bible and the New American Standard. Uh, here's the famous passage in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of God? And he, here you can see uh, uh, the difference in the New American Standard and the ESV over how the person conceives of the phrase in English all day long. Can we just say all day long or can, do we have to say all the day long?
And notice this real expansion of this in, in the message. And how he changes some of this terminology completely. So he feels like it carries a more modern emotional impact. Yeah, he probably takes his reader person's talking to. Yeah, yeah. This is clearly an attempt to, to, to say something in a very impactful way in English. Does it become like storytelling? Yes, it becomes, and certainly in narrative passages, that's what you get is, is real, genuine storytelling. Uh, and the, the, the change that has happened in biblical uh, thought in the last generation, there has been a real gauge in that so that several years ago, um, Abington Press started producing a series of commentaries called the Storytelling Commentary. And they would have somebody totally recast the story. Um, so it, it, you know, they change the characters from men to women, or they would change the time setting, and uh, still trying to get the message of the story, but totally retelling the story. Uh, no, this isn't. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and well, no, it's well. What they're doing is trying to get you to to think about the story because of the way the characters relate to each other and impact. It's the as I said, it's a yes, yes. Yeah. Does it become does it become disrespectful if it becomes more about like the emotion and storytelling? Yes. Right, if, if you're reading like the, the original ones, you're studying the word, then you're gonna learn what kind of character Peter had, what kind of character Paul had. Yes. You, you get that with, with the earlier version. Yes, when you see your introduction, when you're studying it. These translations were made, you see, for the person who hasn't studied it and is not going to study it. They want to throw something at him that will impact him uh, as strongly as it can. And uh, the, the, the complete paraphrase, and I think I've got one on here, uh, where you get this is, uh, Jordan, who does a translation of the New Testament, he calls it the cotton pat version. And he actually recasts the text in 1960s uh, South, uh, Southern America. And so the book of Romans is not addressed to the capital city of Rome. It's addressed to the capital city of Washington, D.C. Jesus isn't crucified. He's Lynched. Well, that's not really trying to take the Bible. That's just like you're saying stories on it. Mean, that's just all the text. I don't see that that has nothing to do to me. It wouldn't, in terms of someone who's who has read the Bible, studied the Bible, lived with the Bible. Well, that's our problem. Is there's too many of them like that. Some people, some people well, don't know that's the reason why you're getting this new American, the, the, the new King James, the modern King James, you're getting the ESV, uh, you're getting the International Standard Version, you, get, you got the Holcomb Christian Standard Bible, which now has been recast as the Christian Standard Bible. And, and these are all attempts to stay on this side of the spectrum, uh, to give you a text that they feel closely represents the 
weigh the, the story, the, the thesis, the argument was uh, worded initially. Uh, and why, as I'll show you in a few minutes, you get people who are very, very, very negative about the ones on this side. Uh, I've got an article that I clipped several years ago from a guy who everything from here over to him is absolute horrible heresy. Uh, the uh, today's English version, uh, the new li the Living Bible is you know to him it's it's apostasy, and he's not willing to give them any valid credit at all. Uh, when of course the reality is that especially the narrative passages of the Bible were initially written much more on this end. In the Hebrew of their day, in the Greek of their day, the story was told as story. It was told in common popular language of their day. So it was originally cast on this side. The Proverbs were ordinary pithy statements of the day in the slang of the day. The poetry of Psalms was poetry of the day and, and carried all the characteristics of popular poetry and song. Uh, so it wasn't over here on the, on a pedestal side and the King James, one of the things the King James was knocked about when it was, when it was first translated was it was too far over here on the vulgar side. It was too far here over on the people's language, the street language. Uh, the King, the, the Bible, the New Testament was written in street Greek, not literary Greek, not classical Greek. And so once Greek, once the Renaissance began and the Western world rediscovered the Greek New Testament, there were several decades, probably even a century, where they considered the Greek New Testament that they discovered as Holy Spirit Greek, because they didn't know that kind of Greek. The Greek scholars of the Western world knew the classics. And the New Testament didn't read that way. It's grammar, it's vocabulary, it wasn't like that. And it wasn't until we found a whole bunch of trash in Greek that we began to realize, oh, this stuff sounds like the Bible, Greek. Because it was, and so now it's called Koine Greek, which is the Greek word for English vulgar. Uh, so people who, you know, I, well, you, I get on the horse here. There, there's just no need uh, to uh, cast such dispersions on these translations anywhere. So as I have said repeatedly, get one you will read and read, but don't trust it on any given verse if you want to be careful and technical, if you want to be exacting, but then. Yeah. Yeah, vehemently. There was a, yeah, there was a huge and still is on a couple of these modern translations. There is heavy popular uh, uh, promotion that this is the most accurate and you really should buy it and forget anything else you've got. Well, that's, you know, uh, I was very, very unhappy uh, when the NIV first came out on a popular level because it was massively promoted and publicized because it had a commercial group behind it. The reality was it was it was started as a contemporary translation 
by the, now I won't be able to remember the name of it. Um, I think it may have been the National Bible Society. Anyway, there, were, there had been for a number of years in this country, two major Bible societies who work to get Bibles in the hands of people, not only in English at real inexpensive prices, but translated in other languages all over the world. They were very, very active. And this Bible society finally got talked into by one of the commercial promote, uh, publishers into letting them buy into their contemporary English translation and complete it more rapidly and then sell it. And so it came out as the NIV. It came out almost the same time, well, actually it came out a little bit later than the today's English version, which was the American Bible Society's contemporary English translation. And the, and, and the American Bible Society never, never gave any printing publishers the right to it, so they were still selling it cheap. You could buy the New Testament for 99 cents in paperback form to hand out to people. You had to pay $9 to get the NIV. Uh, and because of that, the NIV was promoted, and, and I didn't find it any more readable than the today's English version was. And it was a whole lot cheaper. Uh, but this had a promoter behind it. Uh, and the reality, of course, it wasn't quite as uh, paraphrastic or, or dynamic translation than the today's English version was. And they could really promote it because the American Bible Societies was the major work of one man that they simply committed to getting it done. And so he did it. He did it in consultation with our guys, but it wasn't a major committee project and the NIV was. And so, you know, it's going to be more accurate and all that kind of stuff. Are these copy shooters that are not? On this paper? No, none of these comments are mine on this paper. And I'm going to show you one that's really radical. In fact, I probably should take some time to point out some of these, some of the, these footnotes are the, are the thoughts of the person who put this together. Yes, and, and you know, take the footnotes at a, as a grain of salt. Their personal opinion. And as I said here, you see, where it says the King James followed the Septuagint, I cannot believe that the Septu that the King James ever followed the Septuagint independently. I know that the King James frequently fell back on the Latin Vulgate. And the translation they put in the King James was not a translation of the Hebrew. They didn't know what the Hebrew meant. And so they opted out for how the Latins translated it in the fourth century. And so I'm almost sure that's what happened here. Uh, I'm very surprised by the chart that uh, the NIV is more middle than the living translation over to the right NLT, because when I was uh, uh, shopping for a Bible, study Bible, I was looking at those two, and I, I mean, I really didn't know who, like, who would tell me which one was the quote better, Yeah, you know, and uh, I, I ended up buying the NLT because I feel like I read more negative stuff about the NIV, so. That's entirely possible. That's entirely possible, especially in the, in the recent years. Uh, and then there are there are a couple of places where the NIV in the New Testament consistently uses a translation that reflects a particular theological position. Uh, and so there was there was always some negative, but there's uh, in in terms of uh, issues like this. Uh, 
the New Living Translation is clearly a more thought for thought, more popular English translation than the NIV is. Uh, and so that it's over here as opposed to this. Uh, and in terms of readership, you see, there are people who would mock the NIV because it's too literal. It's not good English. Uh, this New Jerusalem Bible, which is what this one is, um, is a Catholic Bible. Um, it's a translation tradition started in French. And somebody produced this modern French translation of the Vulgate, not of the Greek and the Hebrew, but of the Vulgate. And it proved to be so popular in French that um, some American Catholics got interested in trying to do the same thing in English. And so they produced the Jerusalem Bible, which is a modern English translation. And they didn't go to the Latin, they went back to the Greek and the Hebrew. Uh, because it was a modern product and it was done pretty rapidly, uh, there clearly was within a few years the felt need to revise it. And so you get the new Jerusalem Bible, which is just an updating and a, clarif and a correction and, and that kind of thing. It's a new edition, really, of the Jerusalem Bible. Uh, but it was because it came from this background of more modern English, it was, is considered by these people even to be less literal than the NIV. And of course, they barely got the Jerusalem Bible in print and out in print when the official Catholic uh, organization here in the States released their New American Bible, which was, is a modern English translation of the Greek and the Hebrew for Catholics. And so it'll have the Apocrypha in it. Uh, and it falls in here toward the middle. Um, I assume that's this one, New American Bible. And so you can see how the, they compare those two, which is probably a legitimate comparison. Uh, Well, I like to read all of the translations, and I really enjoy reading the English Bible. Yes. It's, I read through the different translations. It, it's, a good, it's a good English translation. I have two or four of them, but I'm going to go back. Let me see how it says the name. Okay. Uh, so that's what this is, and you've got several pages of comparisons. Um, and, and they're different. Uh, I may have even combined two things here. Yeah, it looks like I did. Uh, because this is a new set of comparisons. On page six, you have a different set of comparisons, different translations. So in the Catholic Bible, I have never, I have never read it. For the, for the same books that like, yeah. the other Bibles, uh, I don't know what you call them, the non Catholic Bibles, it reads the same. It's the same. It's well, it, it reads the exact same thing, the text. Does. Oh, yeah, it the text is the same. The other well, and, I, and let, me, let me clarify that in terms of um, you have to be sure that. The translation, the Catholic Bible was translated from the English, from the Greek and the Hebrew or the Vulgate, the Latin. Some of the uh, Catholic translations, like the very first one, Dua Reigns, which has been revised numerous times. And I think eventually they came out with an edition actually based on the Greek and the Hebrew. But originally it like the, uh, uh, early uh, uh, modern uh, English translation of the standard Catholic Bible in the United States. It was a translation of the Vulgate, 
of the Latin. And so you would have numerous passages where there'd be a slight different phrase because it's taken from the Latin. So you're translating a translation. Uh, plus the fact that there were a lot of those uh, textual, those uh, text differences that we saw, uh, there'd be differences there. Uh, but yeah, right. Uh, so you can look at those comparisons. I've got a couple more of those for you to see. Uh, let me grab another one. I have a long one. Um, starts with uh, Genesis on the front page. Is that this one? I think, yes. King James, New American Standard. Uh, that's too big. Uh, Genesis 1 should look like this on the front page. Well, I know I gave it to you because it was the first one I laid out when I was sorting them out. So it may be on the, it may be on the bottom of your stack. And there's like, uh, there's several pages of it because I go from this comparison that I borrowed from somebody, and I use the uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, the creation of mankind. And, uh, You don't see the, the uh, look at uh, verse 27. Uh, in the King James, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Did, did everybody pay any attention to the fact that's bad English? God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. English Standard Version does the same thing. New King James. does the same thing. New Revised Standard Translation finally gets it right. So God created humankind, not man, but mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, mankind. Male and female, he created them. The man in the first phrase is not the word for male person, male individual. It's the word man, like our English word man for mankind. <laughs> See? I know. And, and, we created this whole gender issue in the language because we didn't pay attention to the fact that most languages do that. And in Hebrew, it, it's instructive because it turns out that the word for mankind, for people, for the human race in Hebrew is Adam. So in Hebrew, you read this, God created Adam in his image. And then when you get over to chapter two and he creates Adam, 
the story begins to show us, an Adam, a man who then needs a woman. It's the same word in Hebrew. And that's the clue in chapter two that the story in chapter two is about more than a man and a woman. It's about Adam, humanity, in its male and female image of God. And I argue, and there are a few other scholars who do, it's not, it's not standard, but I argue that the only thing said here in the text that what might describe what the image of God is that we represent is that we're male and female. And therefore I argue that a person is not in the whole image of God. Only a married couple are the image of God. And that's why God doesn't have to have a consort because he's whole, male and female. And that's why in the Old Testament, God doesn't have a bit of trouble referring to himself with feminine models and metaphors. He can call himself a mother hen. He can call himself a nurse, a nursing nurse even. Uh, well, that's interesting because to me that sounds like what you're talking about today. You are human, you are God, God, and you can say that you can utilize the people, you are human. And that's just what you got stuck on saying, if I understood you correctly. Yes. Okay. We're, <laughs> you, you know, I as a person am only part of the image of God. And all of us, and, and given, you see, the difference not only of our male and femaleness, but then the variations of all the qualities that are therein means that none of us is an adequate image of God. It takes all of us compositely to begin to have an image of God. So especially the chauvinism that developed in Judaism and then in the, especially the early middle ages of the church is totally off base. Uh, that somehow we males have a way larger corner on God than the females do. Uh, that uh, because there's a whole lot of God that we don't have. <laughs> uh, and, and the more you hype specific qualities and characteristics as masculine versus other characteristics that you classify as feminine, the more certainly and absolutely you make your masculinity a misrepresentation of God because it lacks all of the feminine qualities that you've refused to accept among yourselves, on yourselves, within yourself, that God possesses. Uh, which incidentally, while I'm at that, I ran across an interesting article uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, where the writer argues that the uh, Greek text, uh, the received text, the textus receptus, that is elevated by especially the worshipers of the King James Version, um, as the best text and have very bad words to say about the other texts that modern scholars prefer. 
uh, and the King James itself, both of them in several cases clearly take readings and translations that are anti-feminine. Uh, they partake of the chauvinism, the masculine chauvinism of the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, uh, one of them I remember is they translate two feminine names as masculines and then refer to them with a masculine pronoun. When they're clearly in, in Greek, feminine names and the pronoun is feminine. <laughs> that, that's, that's the quote textus receptus, that's the Latin. The English is received text. And I ran into an interesting discussion of that where one scholar insists that the printer who used that term, when he said, this is the, receive, this is the text received by, he clearly means the text received by his fellow scholars as probably the better text. And, and it's not a manuscript. It's clearly an eclectic text where he, like all the others on various places, chose which Greek reading he would put in his printing. And so it was his choice and his choice differed in a few places from other people, but he felt like across the board, his printing represented what, mo what was the consensus among the other, whatever, however many 20 or 30 scholars of the Greek text there were in his day, that they would agree with him on the vast majority of those cases. And so this was simply the text that he thought his contemporaries, his colleagues agreed on. Not that it was a superior text, but it was the one they could agree, they agreed on the most, and it was a text they created. They didn't have a manuscript of that. They had chosen at various places, readings from different manuscripts to create this. They agreed on these, they agreed on the, on the specific readings in these particular passages, that his choice of wherever there were alternatives, his choice he felt was shared by a majority of the scholars of his day. And so it was simply the text that they would receive as, an, as a, a fully appropriate printing of what they could agree on was probably their best guess of what the original New Testament looked like. And the argument that the scholar who's reporting this makes is that those guys would have been the first to say when a new manuscript was found, well, we got to take that into consideration. And therefore, my next printing will be different. My next received text may be modified because we've got new evidence. We've got whatever. Uh, uh, that's free for the night. Uh, uh, this one that I gave you that started with this one in Genesis, uh, I go to uh, after a couple of pages Page five, we have the first four verses of Psalm 24 uh, that you can read in a variety of these translations. Psalm 23, I'm sorry, yes. Which of course is a very popular passage. Um, one passage to one look forward to look at is, of course you see the figures. Uh, watch particularly what they do with shadow of death.
And notice the NIV even gives you a footnote on that. Through the darkest valley. Because it turns out that shadow of death is a paraphrase. Is a paraphrase? Yeah. It's perfectly good English translation. Beautiful, poetic, vivid, strong. And again, remind you that this whole issue of literal versus thought is constantly messed up in both Hebrew and Greek with idiomatic terminology. My point earlier that the, much of the Bible is written in popular language, rich in metaphors, strong language, almost slang. And notice, you see, the message still uses the death valley imagery. Still uses the word death, although now he's converted it into an entirely different image for Americans. Nobody else in the world would know, recognize Death Valley capitalized as a particular place. And see, the reality is except at night, Death Valley is the opposite of the imagery of darkness of the psalm. What the psalmist is looking at are those ravine passages that you have in Palestine where it's very, very narrow and only hardly it's straight up noon does the sunlight get down in the valley, into this gully. And so it's dark even in the daytime. Uh, and of course, Death Valley, you don't think of Death Valley as dark. You think Death Valley as blinding sun. Uh, they could, they could have, uh, not capitalized yeah, I, I think if he not capitalized it, he might have reduced some of that, but he did, see, because he was going for this desolate, dangerous, deadly place, uh, and not concerned about the, the darkness of the original imagery. Uh, notice the turn the contemporary version does on this um, leads me in righteousness. And the contemporary version is on page eight, bottom of the verse three, you refresh my life. You lead me in the paths of righteousness, which in, in that terminology, you see, you're looking at God leading me to walk in the right path, in the right way, behaving myself, doing the right thing. And they turn it in. You lead me in the path of righteousness, your righteousness. You are true to your name. It's not me that's been staying on the right path. It's your staying on the right path. And one could easily argue, you see, one, you lead me in the paths of righteousness. Well, is God, is the psalmist talking about his righteousness? Is we talking about God's righteousness? And then I give you a same thing on Isaiah 7. 
which has several interesting features to it. Not only is what the lady is gonna get called, behold a virgin will become pregnant and bear a son and who calls his name Emmanuel and whether that gets translated and how clearly this issue of the child and his ability to know right and wrong And see, the NIV chooses the woman who will give birth and call him Emmanuel. And the New King James does that too. And of course, see the good news got clobbered because they wouldn't translate virgin. Virgin, they just translated a young woman who's pregnant will have a son. And we'll call him Emmanuel. And see the sign here in this version, in this idea is that this girl, this young lady, gives her son this name, God's on our side, God's with us. Even though they're in the midst of this dangerous situation where two kingdoms have allied themselves with the intention of eliminating Judah, conquering it. And God says, this young lady is going to give you a sign. She's going to call her son. God's with us. And it's going to come true because before this boy is old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, they're going to be gone. They're not going to be near. So she was prophetic. She knew what she was talking about. She had women's to intuition. Because the prophecy you see that Isaiah gives is they're not going to go away when this child is born. They're not going to be gone until he's a couple of years old. So they're going to be around for a while. Now, the easier way to understand that, you see, was would be that when, by the time this child is born, the danger is already gone. So it's easy for her to call him Emmanuel because God's demonstrated he is with us. He's saved us from this situation. But the writer doesn't say that. I mean, Isaiah doesn't tell the king that. He doesn't say. It. By the time this kid's born, he's going to get the name Emmanuel because they're going to be gone. They're going to be out of the picture. You won't have to worry about them anymore. Um, then I do the same thing with uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. And you can see how various translations deal with the blessed. And notice the switch from the good news to the contemporary, page 15. The good news was happy <laughs> to translate the emotional character of the word blessed and simply paraphrase it happy. 
Whereas the contemporary, which comes later and is more deliberately paraphrastic, it, it, it willing to narrow the concept of blessing to just the emotional feeling of happiness. And so they revert back to the word bless again, and now they turn it into an active verb, God blesses those people who. Well, the contemporary version, uh, verse six at the very end, it says they will give them what they want. And that's kind of like where we are these days, where it's like, you know. Uh, Yep. Yeah. Um, except that the, the 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 they would argue that the phrase the, the what they they will be given what they want is focused on the fact that they want to obey more than eat and drink, and therefore God makes them obedient. They get what they wanted. They become obedient. But I can see how you could, you your reading would be very apt to happen. That people would read this, those who want to obey God more than eating or drinking will get whatever they want. So you gotta be careful, see how you translate. How are people gonna read this? And then we do John 3.16, and there's a bunch more of these. Uh, and we're about to run out of time. So let me um, go to one that I wanted to show you. And I just gave you the first page of this one. Um, Oh, it's this one, I think. No, I didn't think that was it. Well, it, it's a good one. Uh, just to remind you, yeah, lineage of modern corrupt versions. It's one page, I think. Let me let me uh, back up a minute and make sure that that's the one I wanted. Um, Choosing. I gave you another comparison set like yeah. this. And um, okay, well, let me see what I gave you then. I gave you something. Translation comparison lineage of modern corrupt. If it wasn't that one. Should be one that's a single page. Oh, wait. Yeah, here they are. It is the one lineage of Uh, 
And uh, the King James Bible has a rich heritage of uncorrupted transmission through the ages. Um, and then the modern versions have a corrupted of deletion, omissions, additions, rejections, confusion, etc. They're a fruit of arrogance, scholarship, which includes homosexuals. He's high on that. Um, if your pastor rejects the pure lineage of the King James Bible, well, there is no pure lineage of the King James Bible. Nearly every printing of the King James Bible changed something. Words, spelling, something. And a lot of them, because they're human printers, were corrupted. A verse got dropped. Oh, the famous one is the seventh commandment of the Ten Commandments, the knot got left out in one printing. I mean, they printed a whole bunch of them before they finally discovered it. Uh, a King James translation, uh, printing, and that printer, his printers missed the knot in the seventh commandment. Uh, so it came out, you shall commit adultery. Uh, and every printing was that way. Uh, the, the changes were made. Uh, and then he goes on this tear about the eclectic scholarship um, they do what they want with the manuscript. And as I just pointed out, the manuscripts that were in the, the printings of the Bible of the uh, New Testament that were in existence when English translators translated from the very first translator on, they all used an eclectic text. They didn't use a manuscript. Now, he does point out here that the argument that the modern scholars use this uh, critical edition, Biblica Hebraica, uh, which is an eclectic text of the Old Testament, just like they use of the New Testament, and that the King James Bible was actually based on one single Hebrew text. Uh, but so, anybody believe that Hebrew text was right in every verse? The other Hebrew manuscript close to it in age that we had, had differences. And there's absolutely no basis to say that the one that the King James translators used was better, more correct than the other one that they didn't use. And that there's something wrong with somebody trying to put an eclectic one together. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that you'll run into. Um, those of you that I sent this to and sent the whole thing because it was cheap, and there's like seven or eight pages to this, and most of it is simply a long list of translations, of English translations. Um, There is another one that I may have sent, but it was even longer to pass out. And the writer makes critiques like this on all of these versions, uh, pointing out serious places where they made a mistake, uh, where they obscure. One of them uh, picks out several verses where he thinks the Trinity is reflected. And so if the pronoun isn't right, then they're hiding the Trinity as though the translators were deliberately trying to obscure an important doctrine because they don't use the prop, in his view, the proper pronoun on in this verse. Uh, when the reality of course is that translation he's debunking makes frequent uses of verses that would reflect the Trinity. The fact that it doesn't on this one, which one can argue that the attention of the writer wasn't Trinitarian anyway.
So this just gives you a lot of examples of the kind of thing that's out there. And uh, my encouragement to uh, follow my wife's example and uh, uh, commit yourself to reading the Bible through on a regular basis every year or two. And every time you do it, uh, go buy one of these inexpensive paperback versions, seven, eight dollars, and use it uh, for the year. And uh, right. And, uh, uh, and then there, for you're not concerned about scribbling on the page, uh, using a pair, using some crayons to mark the passages that strike you one way or the other, uh, green for go and red for stop and black for bad and <laughs> whatever it is you want to do. Uh, uh, because inevitably you'll read a passage that you've read many times before and because of the way it's worded this time, it'll strike you. And it may be a bad reading, but it caught your attention. It made you go look at this verse a little more closely. And you finally concluded, well, these guys did a bad job. Fine and dandy. But the fact is, it made you go to that verse and study. it. Uh, and so it did its job. It was simply supposed to be a starter. It was supposed to be a prompter. And what are you trying to tell me, God? <laughs> yes. If it makes you question, it makes you ask, that, that's its job. Is this, and, and there will be more, there should be many times that when you read it, you will stop, you will be stopped dead in your tracks and say, really? Is that really what you meant? Are you sure? Uh, and then you need to, now, if you're concentrating on your Bible reading, that's when you need to have your piece of paper right handy for you to write yourself a note on that and say, well, that's one to look at, but I got to go on and get these other three chapters read today. And you go on and you read. Uh, but there's, having a cheap Bible that you'll write that in the margin. So it's right there. You can't escape it. You can't lose it. It's right there on the page. It'll be easy to find. Uh, your kid can't even pull it off and throw it away. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just a cheap copy of, the, of God's word. And it's there for you to write on because you want to study it. Did you, Angie, did you get a copy yet? But did you have to read that after more than two decades in the Hebrew Bible, the Bible from Genesis? Did you have to read that article last week? No, but you were in the handout? Yeah. It was the last one of the handouts. Well, uh, you need to read it. Uh, I, 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 there, we had a copy of it. Sit down with the first one that I talked to. I said, well, guess what? We're giving each other for our wedding anniversary. The Hebrew Bible is the Tanakh. Tanakh. The Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Well, in the Torah, is that just in Hebrew or have they translated it into English? Oh, that, all that's translated into English. There, there are several modern. English translations of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and uh, the official one of the Reformed Jews uh, is, is called the Tanakh. And you can get a fairly inexpensive print of her printing that okay. uh, in English. It was done in English, modern English. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's like the NIV, it's for the milk. Um, they're more aware of. They weren't going in a while. Oh yes, it was a long, it was a long style. This is the one. Okay. Yeah. It took them that long to get the Bible. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
then this Albrecht man is an independent translation of England. And uh, I think the Torah has even been produced by a different group uh, in English, modern English. And there's a, at least the first five books. That's two or three. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think it's on all these longer lists that I've given you in this regular class. Um, it should be on one of those lists too. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, it's really Yeah. And uh, yeah, I try not to read it. The uh, and uh, and and he he's he's clearly right on on those issues that uh, we. We in, in, in American Christianity have not done a good job at all of schooling our people in the language of the Old Testament. And we had an obvious example of that tonight, the passage in Genesis 1. Uh, the vast majority of people still read that thinking of God created a man because it said God created man. In his image, he created man. Uh, but uh, it's clearly inclusive. He created humanity. Uh, Downfall, you met it. And I go, hold on a minute, you know. But like you say, it's all this interpretation. And so when it comes down, that's the reason a lot of people don't read the Bible. They don't understand it. Yes. And then some of this stuff is really false. Yeah. 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 The uh there was just uh, we we have not we just not have we just have not done a good job uh, even in those traditions where the the Bible at least is read every Sunday an Old Testament passage a gospel passage a, a um, letters passage uh, there's three readings. Uh, quote, religiously done. Uh, we, we just have really fallen down in helping our people understand that. And okay, I'm glad uh, you all hung in. Appreciate your participation, your presence. Uh, look forward to sharing with you another time. If you're, if you're uh, uh, daring enough to try. Is this our last class? This is our last class. Yeah. This is the last class. Brother Platt. Did I, uh, did I overlook any questions that anybody had? Yes. Brother Platt, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You was first. Oh, sorry. Well, um, it, I may not be getting the sound. Uh oh. <laughs> Can you hear me, Brother Platt? Uh, the sound said it was on. I can hear you. Can you hear? Uh, and it said my sound. He cannot hear us, I don't think. Oh, okay. He did something. Oh. Oh, 
Well, they stayed in, so I'm hoping they were able to hear me. Well, I wasn't muted. I'm hoping you all were able to hear me. Yes, sir. We could hear you. Can I'm you hear not us? hearing them for some reason. No? Okay. Well, I guess that's the end. Yes. Yes. Can you hear us? I'm going to type it in the chat. Yeah. That's a good idea. He might see the chat if he's looking. Oh, I must have wrong here. Um, okay, let me get this. Go ahead and put it in the chat, the question you had. I'm not sure what's happening on the sound here, but something's going haywire. We showed the meeting that we're down the town. Oh, no, he's not retired. He's moved. He's on the retired. You can send them in just as soon as you get them ready. They're, they're going to push me, but that's okay. When you get them to me, I'll take them. I'll bid you ladies adieu. Again, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. I'm not hearing you, Ada. Thank you. For whatever reason, um, I'm not getting the sound. There are some small Guys, I don't think it can still hear me. I just wanted to tell everyone I'm taking the class, and it was nice to have uh, college credit in terms of being able to transfer that is severely limited to the colleges that would accept it. Okay. 
there are a few that historically have accepted students from here. I'm not sure what their current status is. They have in the past. Then, then they still may, because they have in the past. There have been students who've gone from here and transferred those credits as electives. Uh, uh, well, when I signed up for the class, I, I, I didn't know. I was like, Friday, I'm not really like signing up for school. So I selected audit. But for the life of Christ, last semester, I was doing every Monday. I was talking to Vivian and I was like, you're not doing the homework. And she's like, well, yeah, you know, she's, it's, like, she's taking it 20 times. Now she's doing the audit. And I was like, oh, then I guess maybe I don't do the homework. You know, like I wasn't sure. And she was like, well, if you do the homework, you can select credit and you'll get credit for it. I'm like, okay. So okay. I switched it to credit. I said, why would I get a lot of credit if I'm doing the work? I've been in class with a lot of people. And sometimes they'll take seven classes mm -hmm. and they, they, you know, for credit. Mm -hmm. And they've been at it maybe four or five years, which I'll have like not the sermon and all the different things. Yeah. They teach. And they claim what they told me if you get through it, that you can go out and you can start a church or you can work as an associate minister. So you don't get credentials. That school doesn't have any way of giving you, know, you credentials. They, they have a certificate of completion that they give. And that's, of course, literally like everybody, every institution, and it's recognized by who wants to recognize it. Uh, and uh, over the years, of course, the educational institutions have all formed these associations of various kinds, and they only recognize work that's done in the well, class. In, in an institution that's yeah, recognized by one of these associations. <laughs> I did last week, not good for this. But, uh, yeah. Because I know some of my guys that come off and run to churches. Oh, yeah, there are a number. Uh, what, this what this school started in was a preacher training school for this uh, association of churches. And that's how they trained their leaders, their preachers. Uh, because they were more lay oriented than some groups, there were a lot of people who went through and took their program, uh, who then went on to do whatever it was they did. They didn't, uh, they didn't become a preacher of a church. They would maybe be a lay leader, an elder in the church. And of course, the women in this particular fellowship had no leadership options. Uh, and yet they would finish the courses right along with their husbands or the guy who eventually became their husband. Uh, and, and then when they moved to Houston, South Houston, in the late 50s, I think, uh, uh, they became more open in terms of accepting students who were simply interested in studying Bible. Uh, and since it was free, uh, why that was an option to get some significant Bible study that you couldn't get anywhere else for free. Uh, and over the years, that segment of the, of the student body has way outnumbered the few who came from that association of churches who wanted to get what little credentials that group had required uh, to be a preacher or minister in their church. Uh, yeah, they're spread, and now they're spread out all over the place. And so when I first became associated with them, um, they might have a six or eight big year. They had 10 or 12 students in the first semester. And of course, now we may have 100 students. Uh, so the number of students uh, who have no association with this group of churches uh, way outnumber the students who do. Uh, but there are, there are students from other groups that have graduated from here who have gotten leadership positions 
um, several fellows in Baptist churches um, uh, are recognized as pastors of their church uh, and their education came, their formal education in Bible came from here. Uh, but that, that church group just did not have the requirement that you had to have a bachelor's degree or a degree from a seminary. Uh, they had various programs for lay leadership. Uh, and nearly all of the, yeah, and, but even the, the, yeah, even the, even the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Baptist church has had a long tradition of lay recognition and they have either their own formal program or they recognize certain um, schools that, uh, that have classes that they feel are acceptable level of work. And uh, if you've uh, gotten good grades at that school, why then they take you through whatever formal process they have to recognize you at whatever level of leadership uh, they want to a, a portion to you in their in their fellowship, uh, and even the more formal groups like the Methodists and the Presbyterians, um, with the dearth of formal clergy nowadays, they're allowing more. Well, even the Episcopal Church is allowing more of this lay leadership uh, recognition to uh, hold post in small especially small towns, rural churches, where they can't begin to find a full seminary qualified clergy that would go there to work. Sure. That, that's going to, that's going to just make that problem all that much worse for them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. There'll be a whole lot more of that. Yeah. Well, and I mean that's not why I why I joined it. Because I once I learned to read something like, why not? Yeah. Then I start there. It's just never know. Where where you might end up? Yep. My home, I know. I started doing this because you know I wanted to learn more. Uh, some some of us I want to be uh, a, a chaplain in the hospital. Yeah. I would love to do that. I have to have a three dollars. Um. There's a um, there's a program at um, Bayshore now. Bayshore Hospital. It's not Bayshore now. It's uh, but uh, there's a chaplain there, and I think he's he's either involved in or he's trying to get started some kind of lay chaplain program. So uh, look him up. Yeah. Look that, look him up. I wonder if I know there if I call, I know the chaplain Yeah, just ask for the chaplain. Uh, and I, I don't know what his paid status is. Or, well, but there again, a whole lot of that, that may be. There is. Uh, there, there used to be in the olden days, there was an institute of religion on the medical center campus. They had a building. And, but the only way you could get into the program was to be enrolled in one of the seminaries in the state or a graduate of one of the seminaries. You guys have a good and I thought, summer. Methodist, and, and, and she was in four months and she died. Everybody got to go and step in the family. And that was in uh, 03. But anyway, when uh, you know, those chaplains, I just want to 